distance learning becomes a priority and a necessity. And distance learning is understood at UNITARN and at the ACT Fund as blended learning. If you have heard the terminology before, blended learning is no more than inviting a potential beneficiary to take an e-learning course first, and amongst the graduates of this e-learning course, we will then invite the, uh, these uh, beneficiaries to come to a face-to-face -face session. Normally, out of 100 uh, beneficiaries, you will have only 30 to 40 that will actually be trained face-to-face. -face. And after you do that, then you can actually empower them through something called TOT, training of the trainers, so they go and they disseminate this uh, uh, training that they have had. So I repeat, we are focused on blended learning. I repeat, we are focused on going from the hundreds to the thousands and the tens of thousands. And if I may share again, we would like to, do, to use intensively technology. So here you have this platform. This platform is no more than a complex website, but it's something that allows people that don't have the means to travel to a particular place to get training. People that don't have the means to pay registration at a university to learn topics like this. People that do have the willingness to engage in these e-learning courses and then in the face-to-face -face activities that I just told you, they apply through this platform to request scholarships from the ACT Fund. So UNITAR, again, is very pleased to uh, build this platform uh, with the ACT Fund hand in hand. So thousands of people can register in the platform, apply for a scholarship, and then take these e-learning courses. I am going to describe the platform in detail, but I simply wanted to give you the whole, the idea behind it. Because a platform, a capacity building platform by itself doesn't, meet, uh, doesn't mean much, it doesn't need uh, to be understood as the solution to a problem, except if we leverage this training platform through blended learning and through TOT. And if I may tell you, this is a model that has been used extensively in the last two decades. We are not creating anything new, but we are giving access to this type of capacity building and this type of knowledge to thousands of people that normally wouldn't have access. So, with that long introduction, if I may, allow me to uh, invite you to see, and this is live now, you can go to www.un, as in the United Nations, dash finance, dash learn, dot org. But basically you have courses on microfinance, on leadership skills, on capital markets, and on anti-money laundering, down. If you, this platform is linked, of course, with the learning platform at UNITAR. If you go through this window, through our, uh, uh, directly to our uh, training platform, you will have courses on negotiation of financial transactions, fundamentals of the financial system, fundamentals of banking, and fundamentals of business finance. As you can see in the examples of topics that we are giving you, this is most relevant for someone that wants to be financially literate for someone that actually wants to know how to engage with a financial system. So in understanding what financial inclusion means, the final objective is to become a productive member of the economic part of a society. Financial inclusion understood, again, as something that requires financial literacy to be a productive member of the financial system or the economic system. Down, please. If you click up, if you click there, registration are open as of now. As of this moment, uh, we will expect to have several hundreds of people registering in the next 30 days. Then we will close the registration and the first courses will start in earnest. To register, you simply click there and then we will ask for some basic information that we will relate to the ACT Fund. So the ACT Fund decides who takes these courses and we are very happy to know, uh, His Excellency has mentioned that they are always open to whoever has uh, uh, a desire to learn. However, we have to prioritize, and there are some countries that will be the first tier. By the way, here we have 
a picture of our, uh, uh, sorry, a video of our Secretary General that you are invited to watch. I, uh, we don't have the time to watch it now. Um, uh, uh, speaking at, uh, uh, in Addis Ababa about the importance of financial inclusion in the fight against poverty. Down, please. Where we work, we primarily target landlocked development countries, L LDCs, least developed countries, LDCs, and a small island development state, SITS. The United Nations, as some of you will know, have a priority list of 92 countries in distress, or least developed countries. There you have a map of that list that includes, of course, um, uh, several seats. Our priority here will be Sub-Saharan Africa, but ACFON has been generous enough to open this to any developing nation. Yet, while financial inclusion is on the rise globally, I think this is also boosted by the fourth industrial revolution, tech-enabled financial products powered by artificial intelligence or blockchain or other technologies that you can name, but uh, also uh, mobile access and the internet. At the same time, you have uh, a lot of countries that are left out. The progress is uneven across countries and across genders and across regions. Um, so we have today around 1.7 billion of people that lack access to financial services. This is a huge number. And if you dig into this number, you will find out that two-thirds of these people have a mobile phone. And today with the mobile phone in a lot of jurisdictions and a lot of countries, uh, yesterday I was in discussion with, with Khaled on, uh, on Bahrain and how you can open a bank account just sitting behind your laptop with a video conference uh, with your banker and get access to a huge number of uh, uh, services. But then also when you get a little bit more granular, globally, uh, women are 10% less likely to report that they have a mobile phone. And this is a global figure. If you go to uh, other uh, developing countries, the number can go as high as 20 to 30% of women that do not have mobile banking and hence would not have access to digital financial services. Uh, a truly inclusive financial uh, system need to break down this, uh, uh, these barriers. There is a, a gender and a digital divide that needs to be uh, bridged. Uh, so the question here that we would uh, like to ask uh, the esteemed uh, speakers uh, is how do we make sure that no one from the humanity's best half is left out of uh, financial uh, um, services. Uh, to address this question, we have an amazing lineup of uh, speakers that I will be introducing in a moment. They will be sharing their narrative, their vision on how to bridge that gap, and hopefully uh, together we could also take away some action uh, item. I'm very also pleased to note that we have a fully balanced gender panel. Kudos to the organizers, thank you. Uh, so let me... Uh, quickly make a round of introduction to the speakers. I'll start with my first uh, uh, speaker on my um, immediate left, Olga Spechard. She is the chair of the Swiss Capacity Building um, Agency. Uh, she has a lot of experience on insurance and I would look forward to hearing more about, you know, uh, how to get women access better and enhanced insurance services and more importantly, how the unbankable can get access to insurance. Then on her left, uh, Norman Fari, who is uh, uh, the former minister of uh, digital economy of Tunisia, among many other duties and hats. Uh, but uh, one of uh, my best choice is that he is the father of an amazing initiative called the Tunisia Startup Act. Uh, something that we all have to learn from. It's uh, major in the uh, Arab world and probably in a lot of uh, other jurisdictions. Then we have uh, Sabine Menza. She's a technical specialist at the UN Capital Development uh, uh, Fund. You've been working on uh, remittance. Uh, remittance are also important for women working abroad, and this is also something that is hugely important for uh, developing countries, and we'd love to hear from you on that. On her left, uh, we have Sukaina Burawi. She's the executive director of the Center for Arab Women 
uh, training and re research. Yesterday we had a dinner together and we had a side discussion. You mentioned that financial service need to be human rights, particularly for women. From your, your background, I would love to hear from you how this can be implemented concretely. And then last but not least, we have uh, Khaled El Ghazawi, the CEO of Ibda Microfinance Bank out of Bahrain. Bahrain has done an amazing leapfrog toward digitalization in many aspects, particularly in finance. We'd love to hear from you on that and your stories. So we have roughly uh, 17 minutes left. I'll go with two rounds of question with the uh, uh, speakers and then we'll open the floor for comments and questions. So please do save your comments for later on. Uh, we'll have uh, the opportunity to open the floor. Without any further ado, allow me to kickstart the conversation with you, Olga. Uh, Olga is the head of Global Insurance Solution at Syngenta Foundation for Sustainable Agriculture. You also have many years of experience in underwriting and developing regulatory strategies. That's amazing. And uh, the question that I would like to start with, Olga, is to what extent digital saving is key to women financial inclusion? Bearing in mind that to use financial services, you need to have some funding available. Olga, the floor is yours. It is a pleasure and my honor to be here back again in Geneva. So digital savings is, is, is vital in women financial inclusion. Women are inherent savers uh, from nature. And um, we believe, you know, through, through our journey, we have seen how um, livelihoods of, of women are improving when they have access to digital tools. They, they start thinking different, they start to behave different, they feel more empowered. So it is um, also a way to, to be more efficient. They don't need to run to the bank, they don't need to, to show off, they can do it at home. They feel um, more secure, they have their own privacy, it's more convenient, um, the accessibility is, is, is just there. So there are so many factors really that um, it's, it's just, on the positive side. And um, uh, we have been also observing um, not only savings, but also with inclusion of uh, insurance solutions through digital pa platforms or financial uh, education, uh, as Alex was just, just promoting before, you know, it's, it's the way forward. It's the way forward for empowering women and for, for really include women in the system. And we are all here to fight for it. Absolutely. You know, I've I've mentioned earlier that uh, women is or are the humanity best house. And I think it's uh, hugely important that they are uh, fully included into economy and into society. I would like to turn to you, uh, Norman, and let me just uh, start with a, a summarized uh, introduction because your biography is so long, you've done so much in your life uh, from different uh, spheres, the political and spheres. still young and uh, of course, and uh, also the private stair. So uh, in addition for being the um, former Minister of Digital Economy of Tunisia, you're also the founder and CEO of uh, B2 uh, uh, Lab, or eight, B8 Lab. So you have 20 years of international experience in energy and technology. Uh, you've also uh, launched something really cool, which is the uh, a North African or Maghreb Startup Network Initiative to, for which you are uh, the chair, I believe. Uh, so this is something that we'd love to hear from you on. And you're also a business angel supporting several early stage uh, Tunisian startups. Uh, there is a, a personal uh, question that I would like to ask you. Is uh, I'm really interested to know why you've left a political career to engage into the private sector. This is more on a personal side. And then on the more, uh, something that is more, um, probably more interesting for the audience is uh, why the Startup Acts? And what are the benefits of a Startup Act for women's entrepreneurs? Thank you. Thank you. I won't answer the private question unless my wife is here. 
So um, I'll, I'll start, thank you, by the way. Thank you, Dr. Nasser, for inviting us and the Yag Fund for inviting us. And before answering, I would like to make statement of the launch of the financial, on the financial inclusion platforms. The training is the people who got trained get certificates, and these certificates for these people are very valuable for them for their careers. So not only for their own knowledge, but for their career. Thank you very much for launching this. We launched something at smaller scale similar, and it had fantastic, uh, uh, fantastic impact. I hope this will, uh, will bring the hundreds of thousands of people to know to be literate in financial inclusions. So to answer your first question, on why Startup Act. I'll be very blunt and direct. When I became Minister of Technology in Tunisia, I was the youngest of my government, I was 50, but when I go to the technology symposium, I am the oldest. So I started to feel a gap between people making decisions and youth making things happen. And uh, I start to see frustration in the eyes of these youth because they have because of the internet, they have worldwide expectation, while governors, they have local delivery mean. So there is a first frustration. But the second and most biggest frustration for our youth is that, as I told you, I was in, in a government when we have youth from the 21st century, government from 20th century, but laws of 19th century. So it was, it was really upsetting for these youth to do things uh, uh, for the new world. So in, in order to uh, avoid an explosion, I called the youth, I tell them, look, we sit in a sitting like this, I said, look, let's work something which we promise you, if you work it thoroughly, we will put it in front of the government in three months' time. And the civil society, the incubators, accelerators, startups believed in this, and themselves, they drafted what became the startup law in Tunisia, which basically say, in a nutshell, please leave startups, do whatever they want. They are not dangerous. Let them do their things. Don't bother them with administrative work, basically. And it, it, it gave a push to the youth and to the startups, uh, to the startups to do new things that they never believed that they will be able to do since we, the government and the administration, left them alone to, to deliver these new solutions. Now, while you are doing this, you know that the government is doing its best to help to help these, uh, uh, these uh, youngsters and to give them the inducive environment to create. However, I remark that the private sector, which is specifically the corporates, which is making tons of money, are not doing their bit. They are still asking the government to deliver things. So I quit politics, I went to the biggest bank, in Tunisia, a private bank, and said, look, you are make, you're making so much money, now you will put a small percentage of that in order for the youth, in order to deliver, a new, to deliver the new economy of the new world. Because otherwise, your customer, all your customer, will disappear in 15 years. Therefore, start to invest in this youth. And luckily, we created the uh, foundation, uh, which, has, which has different different level of uh, offerings. The first offering is a cultural on entrepreneurships between 15 and 18 years old uh, people. We, we gather people from all over the country on a weekend and we- 18, huh? a, 15 to 18, 18 yeah, yeah they're, they're high young. school. On a weekend, we gather them in, a, in, a, in one of the universities and over a weekend, we choose two or three SDGs and we ask the youth, okay, with some trainers, etc. now it's your role to solve these problems using social companies, uh, create social companies or create commercial company to solve these problems. And it is unbelievable how much these youngsters come with ideas. They are only 15 and 18 years old, and obviously we help them through the startup methodology, etc. And at the end, they present in front of uh, big CEOs these are the solutions we want to build for our futures. And what the good thing about this, that this youth, we started this four years ago, these, they, became, they went to university, now they are doing 
clubs of uh, the, the program is called Spark. Nice. They are making Spark clubs, and instead of having hundreds, now every year we have thousands of children doing these weekends in order, creating new companies, imagining new companies with a full-fledged company. This is the purpose of the company, this is the business model, this is how much, how much uh, the sustainability, financial, etc. And it created this willingness to deliver things. Now, what is important for women empowerment? Uh, our, uh, our, um, our objective is gender equality. But when we started, we started with 25% girls, 75% uh, boys. Because, you know, sending uh, young girls to a weekend for this in our culture is complicated. But then people start to see the advantage. Now we have the opposite. We have 75% girls, 25% 25, 25 uh, uh, boys. We are now balancing. So that's one offering. So if you allow me to go through two other offerings. But when these guys wanted to deliver wanted to start to create a company, they needed some guidance, some help. And government tools are not, no, no matter how good is the, the government, and I believe my government was good, but no matter how good is the government, it can't serve entrepreneurship the way that private sector and the private uh, player do. So we created an incubator called Be At Labs. And the objective of this incubator is create over 500, 400 new startups. We started with 10, then 20, then 30, and our objective is to have 400 startups with the same, with the same um, objective. It's 50-50, 50% women, 50% men. And it's working. Now we did 40, so 10% of our objectives and it's starting to work, and we take people from the level of nobody, nobody will invest in them, because they are still trying uh, to do something, to the level that they are investable and some uh, business angel or some basic uh, funds can invest them. We, 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 we pass that chasm, which is the valley of death for entrepreneurs, and it's starting to do good jobs. So what we did after that, and I'll stop here, we went to look what's happening in other countries around the region. We saw that in Egypt, for example, Flat6 Lab and Accelerator is doing a good job. So we brought Flat6 Lab to Tunis and we invested in order to have the full chain from the entrepreneurship culture to the, to the uh, you know, acceleration. And now I'm proud to say that we have an ecosystem, uh, an, an ecosystem in Tunisia for startups, which is mainly led by women. And somebody this morning said, women are not that good entrepreneur, or I hope that she, she didn't mean that, because I believe that women are much better entrepreneurs than men, because they waste less time in coffee shops and shisha, <laughs> and they are, they are much focused on the jobs. And our investors, they, our investors have now we started to have an investor who wants to put $1 million or $2 million for funds only for women entrepreneurs. And that started to, yeah. uh, to create a, a synergy that we can talk about it later. I fully concur with you. Yeah. I think uh, congratulations, first of all, for uh, doing such a great job in Tunisia. We love these bright spots and we love to learn from experience. I would like to jump straight to Khaled on this because he has some stories to tell us out of Bahrain. Khaled uh, Al-Ghazawi is the CEO of Ibda Microfinance. He uh, uh, also has uh, uh, more than 24 years of experience in microfinance, capacity building and commercial bank, uh, banking. He's also working uh, worked with a few of the top leading microfinance networks such as AG Fund, Finca, and Agrican uh, Agency for uh, Microfinance. Uh, so uh, the question I would like you to address, uh, Khaled, and if you can give us some concrete example from your own story. What are the features of existing digital models that are used within the AGF network of financial inclusion banks? The floor okay. is yours. Um, thank you, Malik. Uh, thanks to ARC Fund and to UNITAR uh, for organizing this very important uh, symposium. Um, uh, I would like to, uh, you know, just before I go on and speak about women empowerment through digitalization, um, 
You know, when I look back at where we started in, um, at least in financial inclusion in 2004 or 2005, all the way until today, I cannot believe it. Uh, honestly, the, the progress we had in this initiative is a dream coming true. Um, and I remember back then, uh, very few people believed that this will uh, be what it is right now. And, uh, and I think we were right, um, you know, to, to uh, we were right to join and to believe and to be proud of what we have achieved throughout the network uh, of uh, the financial inclusion banks. In terms of Ag Fund, um, you know, empowering women is one of the pillars, as was mentioned this morning. And for that, um, while, you know, implementing any of our missions or any of our um, initiatives within Ag Fund, women are kept in, um, you know, in perspective all the time. Um, uh, whether it is the uh, whether it is uh, financial services, whether it is education, um, uh, whether it is training, like what Kauter are doing through the online um, access to training, what the Arab Open University are proudly doing in terms of education, distance education, distance education, what we are doing in certain in some of our countries in terms of uh, savings in terms of uh, uh, providing credit, in terms of insurance, uh, like the online insurance product that uh, our colleagues in Sudan, um, with the support from the, uh, from the Swiss Capacity Building Program, have implemented, where people can get even um, you know, weather forecasts of whether it is a good day to plant or not, um, beside making sure that they can get insurance instantly online. If we look at Yemen, for example, uh, despite the uh, war that is taking place in Yemen, we have a very unique program that kept Al Amal Bank for Microfinance, Ag Funds Bank in Yemen, as the only operational bank, or one of the very few operation, you know, operating banks in Yemen nowadays. Um, whereas we have dispersed hundreds of millions of dollars in cash assistance to um, to poor women using technology, because with their finger stamp, they could identify that this is their beneficiary and receive it and receive the, the support throughout a network of over 8,000 uh, point of sale, imagine, in Yemen, in such a difficult situation. Um, in Jordan, we have an excellent uh, online uh, tool, uh, a mobile application that's being used by both men and women to apply for credit, um, inquire about their installments, pay their installments using their wallets. Um, uh, uh, in all of our banks, we are now using uh, digital platforms for loan applications even, so we don't anymore fill um, you know, loan applications on paper. Uh, it's paperless almost in all of our banks where tablets are being employed, you take copies of the IDs, of the, um, of the necessary supporting documents, you disperse through the wallet, or like in Bahrain, we disperse through a prepaid credit card, and the client can use that card um, in Bahrain to, um, you know, to, uh, to either purchase his raw materials or products that he, wa he or she wants to sell, um, uh, and can pay using the government tool, believe it or not, in Bahrain. Um, and again, thanks to Agfund for that, because if Agfund did not come to the central bank in Bahrain back in 2014, when we took over Ibda Bahrain, that was going down the drains, uh, if Agfund did not come and talk to the central bank and build that vision of digitalization, the central bank wouldn't have established their own platform now where you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Now you just uh, link yourself to the benefit system. You can receive installments, you can pay directly to your clients, you can uh, deduct from their, from their accounts and so on and so forth. So, um, and again, I go back and say, women are the center of all of that. So women now can open uh, or, uh, you know, receive their loans online. And without the, you know, because again, we are, we are in the Arab world and women usually are 
more or less controlled by the husband or the family. Now the woman is the decision maker, thanks to this tool, because now they can go, cash their loan, use it, or use the credit card to buy their own materials and sell and buy. So solution exists. I would like to come back to you on the second round on how to scale them up. But uh, uh, before that, I would like to uh, turn to our two uh, other panelists. I would like to start with uh, you, uh, Sukaina Burawi. I've had a, an amazing discussion with you last night. Thank you so much. I think you are uh, the representation of one of the best advocates for feminism. Uh, the question I would like to ask you, Sukaina, is what is, what is the future of digital uh, chan channels? Uh, that can uh, promote women. How can we use the digital for empowering women? Thank you. Uh, I want also to thank particularly um, His Excellency for the words of this morning because he thanks his wife. And I think that all the wives have to be thanked. My wife is also among <laughs> all the of audience. You, almost of, of Kudos you to her. <laughs> have to thank the wife and women because what women are doing not because they are only the half of the population, but because they are taking care of almost the other half. And especially, they are ca taking care for children and for elderly. It means that really, women are to be supported and to be not supported, but to be <coughs> recognized. I think that the recognition <coughs> that uh, I saw in this room this morning uh, authorized me to say that the future may be more bright than now. But I have also to be very clear, we have to work a lot <coughs> on the present to have this... Uh, I acknowledge it. ...this uh, future. We have some way to go. Okay. Just, if I understand, you want me and you ask me what advantage does the fourth revolution present for women? Absolutely. Yes. You know, I think that ICT and digitalization today as, uh, is reshaping the world. We cannot be out of this world because we are the half, as I said before. And uh, yes, exchange, ICT exchange, digitalization, and especially for rural women, for rural area, can really give a lot of opportunities and new opportunities for uh, women who have not access to formal economy and to services. But, but, I have to say but, because if not, I have not to work on this field. But we are working in many regions, at least, and even in the world, we are working in a context where 60% of people have no access to internet, and we are working in a world where internet is expensive for a lot, a lot of population. It means that if we have no the ACFUND families, the UNITAR, the UN system, and if we are not highlighting this, their work, we could not really make progress. It means that together, and only together, as per the SDGs and the Goal 17, are pushing for the cooperation, the partnership, the triangular cooperation, because I am advocating for partnership not only by, between private sector and government, I am introducing in the triangular cooperation the NGO, because without civil society, we can't do really the progress toward women, because only civil society knows exactly the needs at very local level, what we can do for women and men, and poor. Because as you know, maybe ICT could give a lot of opportunities, a lot of opportunities. But you know that women are still discriminated 
the statistics are there, the indicators are there. In many ways, there. unfortunately, in many ways. And uh, they have no voice. They are not with us, the poorest. They are the poorest of the poor. And we have to be very open to them. And I think that what you are doing here, and you are the champions. I am almost an outsider of this financial world. And uh, I am in the beginning an academician, a social. I have to give data. I have to analyze. But what I am re really observing, that the world is changing. And now I think that we cannot reach uh, progress. And digitalization is a tool, is not end. And I think that the approach that we adopt in Kautar, thanks to ACFOND and other donors, other partners, I prefer to speak about partners, that we try to expand the knowledge. We try to expand the opportunity for whom cannot access to access, to access to the knowledge, to access to services, to access to address sometimes just to data to say that uh, Mr. Norman is working uh, very nicely in Tunisia, but nobody knows, not sufficient body knows. We have to inform that this service exists. And I think that for us, it's human rights. The rights to access to services, the right to access to financial services. Because 20 years, I worked on economics empowerment. And one day, I discovered that there was a part missing in the economics empowerment, is the financing empowerment. And I like that, I am here. This is For a that, I am here. very important item. I'd like to invite uh, UG Fund and UNITAR and whoever is the reporter of the session to write it down that uh, uh, access to financial services for women should be considered as a human right. Thank you so much, Sukaina. I think there is also hope that uh, uh, the cost of uh, internet going down, the cost of mobiles going down, will ultimately improve affordability of uh, financial services and technologies uh, for women and unprivileged uh, people. Let me turn to you, Sabine Menza. So uh, you've got a huge experience in remittance, uh, You've uh, worked out of uh, Toronto for uh, Western Union, I believe, and, uh, and you've also been working on uh, uh, many other issues uh, like uh, uh, issues related to regulation, um, government service providers, and donor to accelerate the development of the development finance services ecosystem in West and Central Africa. And uh, the, uh, the very nice feature that I see in your work is the fact that you've also tried or succeeded to uh, get branchless services to uh, the uh, population. I would like to hear from you more about this model of having branchless uh, services. No need to have uh, uh, an expensive uh, bank branch in uh, a village, for instance, to get access to financial service. The floor is yours, Sabine. Well, thank you very much. And allow me to thank also the Ag Fund, Dr. Nasser and UNITA for the opportunity that I have here today to uh, speak on behalf of UNCDF, the United Nations Capital Development Fund. We make sure that public and private finance work for the poor by providing last mile digital finance solutions and also investing in local development projects. We are the agency for the 47 least developed countries. Now with that said, let's turn to technology. Technology in itself is neutral. It can lead to inclusion or exclusion based on the way it's deployed. We need to make sure that new forms of exclusions are not being introduced in the growing digital economy that we are seeing. We need to make sure that we are not contributing to that digital divide, to that you know, digital revolution. So for us at UNCDF, we believe in digital economies that leave no one behind. Our mission is quite simple. It really, we're looking at how we accelerate the development of services, leveraging digital finance and innovation by providing the right balance of technical assistance and financial instruments to the private sector, nonprofits, academia, 
and also government. Now, our goal, daring, you might say, because by 2030, we will equip millions of people to use innovative services in their daily life to improve their own you know, life cycles, to improve their own revenues, to improve their own opportunities, and yet at the same time, achieving the sustainable de um, development goals. Now, with that said, we've heard earlier from uh, several of my co-panelists the challenges ahead of us. 1.7 billion people are unbanked. Billion. Out of these, 56% women. Million, 1.7 billion. 1.7 billion, that's what I said. I heard million. Sorry, 1.7 billion unbanked adult, of which 56% women. Earlier you've mentioned the gap in mobile phone ownership. Let me add that women in low and middle income countries are 36% less likely to have mobile money services than men. And you've talked about internet access, 26% less likely women to use mobile internet versus men. So the question really is, how do we then mainstream this vision for us UNCDF of leaving no women behind in the digital era? Well, it starts, we start with data. We believe that if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. So at UNCDF, we've developed the Inclusive Digital Economy Scorecard, IDES, which we launched about two weeks ago at the UN General Assembly in New York. Now, what the framework that we see for inclusive digital, um, the inclusive digital economy is really anchored around four work streams. First, it's an enabling regulatory and policy environment. We work with central banks, financial regulators, telecom regulators, competition and government authorities to make sure that the regulatory environment open, offers an incubation opportunity for digital economy to be realized. So in particularly in that angle, we are advocating and partnering with the different stakeholders in building the regulatory technology, reg tech capacity, so that we can bridge the gender data gap and know where we are starting and work our way to improve the inclusiveness of digital economies. The second work stream for us is open digital payment infrastructure. Now, if you are not connected, you are by default exclusive, excluded. GSMA estimate that there are 433 million women that are unconnected, totally. So for us, the digital infrastructure has to be available, accessible, affordable, and we are working on building with the different stakeholder universal access to the digital ecosystem. Because we feel that that is the starting point. Now mind you, access is great, but guess what? Usage is better. So the third work stream for us is inclusive innovation. It's really looking at beyond finance, where digital can add value and help improve outcomes of women. How do we apply digital technology on the different sectors that women are involved? In agriculture, leveraging information for best agricultural practices, leveraging new technology, access to um, mobile telephone records, blockchain technology, for digital credit scoring schemes that would enable women who have no credit history to have access to microcredits and be able to invest it in revenue generating um, activities. We believe that innovation and the potential of technology really needs to be channeled towards these inclusive innovation where we know it's going to change the livelihood of women where they are, where they need it. And the fourth work stream for us is really empowering women to digitize. I want to give you a specific example of how integrated approaches, and which has been mentioned before by many of the co-panelists, can have the impact that we're looking for. In Uganda, for instance, we work with Trust Bank to develop a mobile application. We call it Trust Girls. It's a mobile application on your phone. I have four elements. The first one is re you're really using gamification techniques to actually 
uh, use the uh, platform to learn about financial education and motivate actually the importance of savings and where you can actually see if you wanted to save, let's say $500 or let's say $50 or $10, what you would need to do every week to get there. The same platform also includes a mobile money wallet, which will enable girls to actually deposit money on that wallet and have the control on how they want to use that wallet and part of that wallet that's going to go through the savings schemes that they've already decided. The third piece of that um, platform is actually reproductive health information. And earlier, uh, the panelist from um, the earlier, uh, yes, she's here and I need to talk to her and see what are the synergies that we can find between you and CDF and our organization. But reproductive uh, health information is available on the platform. And the last piece is actually a mentoring chat box where women, does these young girls have the privacy to ask each other for advice, but also ask mentors about the feelings that they worried much about. That's just an example of uh, the type of initiatives that we work in with the private sector, the financial institution. We provide the technical assistance and also the grants to be able to put this platform together and we're looking forward to scale those uh, in other markets. So this is just to give you a snapshot of how our um, framework That's works. That's not only snapshot, <laughs> this is very thought-provoking, very thought-provoking. Thank you so much, Sabine. I think uh, it wraps up well the first round of uh, uh, questions I would like to get back to you, uh, Olga. One of the uh, comments you made, Sabine, is around uh, access uh, to uh, mobile banking. So I would like to uh, turn to you, Olga, on uh, how to address or how to promote mobile banking for women empowerment. That's probably my, my favorite one. And the word upscaling, it's, it's, it's really key in this, in this discussion. Obviously, um, mobile technology is, is, is the new era, you know, is, is the way to, to fly. But um, still behind, we cannot really undermine or just, just forget the still our human touch and connections and discussions between the public sector, the private sector, the regulatory environment um, still plays a key role. You can have the most sophisticated uh, digital tool in place, but um, still you might have a system in a specific country which the regulatory environment uh, is, is not there, or just the connections simply they do not support, and then a licensing product is just stuck for two years and it won't, it won't fly. Or even a payout, a claim, an insurance, you know, which is in the hands of uh, a reinsurer in a fancy office in Zurich that doesn't push the button or sign the paper, you know, it won't, it won't reach. So we need more leadership here. We need leadership. We have the perfect uh, example here um, within the Akfan family, you know, and it, uh, it is Sudan again. And uh, Adel is here and it's, it is, it is my, my biggest proud, you know, we have been working within 10 months uh, on a speed, but that speed was not thanks to the mobile technology, it was about connections, it was about uh, His Excellency coming to Khartoum with us and introduces the central bank within three minutes, you know. It was about to run a delegation from Kenya bringing uh, Mr. Elias Omondi from Kenya to Sudan and share the experiences from the regulatory environment in Kenya and bring it over to Sudan. And this is really fundamental. I think we know? need a round of applause for uh, the Secretary General. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, so again, I mean, you can have the most fancy technology, but still the kickoff is, is in our hands, right? And uh, of course, the access to finance through mobile technology is, is there. But let's just reach out to the millions of so, unserved so women out there. If I understand correctly, it's man-made barriers, not really the infrastructure itself, which is widely available. Now, man, I would like to get back to you uh, you've been uh, part of the Tunisian government. You've uh, led huge efforts for inclusion as part of uh, the government overall efforts. And we'd like to hear from you 
how do we scale up uh, uh, the digital uh, financial services uh, to populations that are in rural areas? Okay, thank you. Uh, first, I think we need all to realize that we are going into high-speed world where the, f the, the pace of transformation is, is extremely fast. So the, if you look back at the last 10 years, what changed over the last 10 years is practically equal to the change of the last 100 years. So the, if you look to 2050, as we are going in an exponential curve, the world will change as much as the beginning of times. So the world from now to 2050, because of technology, will change drastically, and most of the businesses we know will disappear and new businesses will come. Therefore, if we don't, if we don't scale up as fast as the world is changing, we will stay behind. And today, I, I heard the four pillars of the pillar for scaling up. Number one, you heard technology, people needs to be connected. If they are not connected, they are excluded by definition, and they don't exist because nobody will have their records, and nobody will be able to provide them services. So connecting is, uh, is number one priority. And that's why I would like also to, to thank the Badia, who is starting to, to think about helping smart, smart Africa on connecting countries among themselves. Because it's good to have connections uh, around the Africa, but within Africa is important. Therefore, we need to lay down fiber optic uh, between the countries. That's number one. But that's long term. Immediately, the, the uh, second most important thing is what I, what I heard. Let's not reinvert, uh, uh, reinvent the wheel. Education is key. But if education works in one country, there is no reason why it should not work in the other countries. Therefore, blended education, as you see in the financial inclusion there, is the way to go. I'll tell you one example that we did for mobile development. In six months' time, we trained, we trained 8,000 people in six months' time on blended education, 8,000 people who never touched a computer before, on mobile developing, 1,000 of them developed application and 200 became entrepreneurs. In one, why? Because of blended education. So the second pillar is, edu uh, is education. The third pillar is government needs to go paperless because paper is poison because the people who have the power of the pen will stop you doing what you want to do. Therefore, paperless government is the way to go. We heard that in Bahrain, for example, uh, it's now practically paperless, therefore people can do things fast. And the fourth thing is changing the laws in order to make them adapted to the 21st century. Once you do these four pillars, our kids, educated youth, women who are more aggressive than men, and uh, from our experience, will be able to climb this pillar and build a new world, a new world that of solutions that we don't know of, and they will reinvent solutions on the, uh, themselves. This solution we are doing component in, uh, I heard Sudan is doing fantastic thing with Ibdaa, but if you combine so, so what you are doing in Ibdaa in, in Sudan with what you are doing in Bahrain, package it and let's take it and put it in another country. I know that the, the law of the country will not allow you to bring something and dump it. But let's start to say, we start with one thing, one vanilla solution, and we dump it in a country, and then we adapt it. If we start with, no, 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 let's see what are the laws of the countries and try to adapt it to our solution, will be there for, for ages. Therefore, the, hence the leadership of people, uh, of people like Dr. Nasser and Dr. Sidi Wilte, who are at the, at the top of this organization and they have a relationship with governments in order to change the law quickly to adapt it. Because if we don't go as fast as the technology is changing, we will be left behind. There will be two words. One word, which is people connected above the table and people below the table, which is outside the world. And I have no intention, and we have no intention, to leave our countries behind. That's why we need to go fast. And to go fast, let's cut and paste. Find, let's not reinvent the wheel. Let's get the solution which works in one country and dump it in other countries and go fast and hope that we will arrive. So we need uh, a private sector-minded leadership, even 
at the government. Yes. Uh, you've mentioned, uh, no man, uh, education, but uh, we could go actually halfway and make it simpler for user to use a financial service. And I'd like to turn to you, Khaled, on your experience and if you can provide us some examples on how uh, did you uh, make simplification happen for financial service? Very good. Very good. Um, thank you, Malik. Um, I think simplicity is the key. If it is as complicated as it is on paper, then it's no use. Um, I can tell you that in Bahrain, for example, if I want to bring the example of Bahrain, it's 89% uh, of the population is, uh, is bankable. So, you know, 89% of the people have bank accounts. Now, bank account in Bahrain, as you said at the introduction, uh, is as simple as logging online, interviewing, or the, the bank officer would interview you, ask you certain verification questions. Uh, with the linkage to the e-government uh, system, all your data is pulled into this, the bank system directly. He verifies the data with you, verifies the address, voila, sends you a box so that you can sign on the screen, and that's it, your, your, your bank account is opened. Um, you know, I think this is the key that we at Ag Fund look at all the time, make the process simpler. Uh, we do that by, uh, you know, simplifying uh, uh, document processing, for example. If you don't need the document, why do you ask for it? Um, we, uh, for example, if you can get, like in Bahrain, if you can get the ID information just by having the number and logging online to the e-government, then why to have a copy of the ID? Why to have a copy of the passport? Why to have a copy of the bank statement when you have an e-KYC system in Bahrain, for example, nowadays? Um, you know, for us at Ag Fund, again, I go back and say simplicity is the tool. Um, you know, uh, Samih is here, our, our CEO in Jordan, and he would, you know, he can speak to any of the uh, distinguished audience if they want to listen to their experience in simplifying processes using their mobile application um, uh, tool. Um, uh, you know, um, you know, making sure that unnecessary documents are not collected, making sure that uh, it's more of uh, it's more of a home-based service online rather than taking the client to your location all the time, um, making sure that uh, you really get to know your client uh, rather than knowing him through documents. Uh, if you do that the process is usually simpler. And this is what made uh, the Ag Fund banks reach now almost $1 billion of loans dispersed since inception uh, to almost 100 million borrowers. Uh, so uh, this is, this is uh, or you know, the impact is for 100 million people. So, uh, you, know, the, 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 um, you, know, the, you know, the simpler you go, the, you know, the quicker and the faster and the less complication you use uh, the faster uh, the service is provided, especially to women that really sometimes lack the access to such documents that you need. Uh, and if you really rely on those documents, then you will never be able to serve the woman, uh, you know, most specifically. Uh, I know in some of those countries, the women do not even have an ID. And when they have an ID, it's in the wallet of the husband, not with her. Uh, so she cannot even open a bank account. Well, if you really rely on that, then that's a problem. Uh, absolutely. Simplicity is the key. This is, I think, uh, a very important takeaway. I'm going to turn to the organizers. I believe that Sukaina has some slides uh, to show us. I'm not sure if uh, someone could get us to the slides from AG Fund, maybe, or Inktar. It's coming. The screen is coming. In, in the meantime, let me ask you the uh, question on scalability. So. Uh, how we scale all what we've discussed and make it happen for women. How we can scale up the digital solutions. By technology first. <laughs> by technology first. And by connection. But uh, I want to uh, add something. Uh, I think that we are living in a world 
where data and it's okay it's okay it's okay just for the audience uh, I, I can i can shift to other things no problem uh, i i think that we are living in a world where data and where technology exist but the problem is that some population cannot reach this data and cannot reach the information on sometimes technology or even some where are the providers you know the problem is really the gap in the information information gap i think that it's very important to say that as this a lawyer, is number I'm one. really interested here because is number one also another side of the coin uh, more data means less privacy yeah from your uh, legal background how do you we ensure that uh, on one hand we have a secured access to financial service and on the other hand we have the privacy of women protected i think that we can combine and a lot of countries can combine and the problem is not that in some countries we cannot combine because i don't think that in this country they are particularly uh, aware about the protection i think that it is a faux problem is not there the, the point is not there the point is there in tunisia for instance and we are not the less development country in tunisia we have three on five young person have no bank account and there 25 27 three on five have no that's bank account and this is terrible because uh, I want to uh, confirm that uh, for some person they said to have an ID to have an ID account is to have an ID and I think it's true because with the ID and with the ID bank you are citizen today without we cannot be and even you cannot even have to go to election we have we need to have the ID but to go to bank to access to services you need to have a password a pass the pass is the, the bank the, the account even for the mobile but I want to, to add something to, to add something that um, we are speaking about financial inclusion and I want to add social inclusion and I want to uh, insist on the fact that financial inclusion is good if to drive to the social inclusion but not per se it's not financial inclusion to be to become rich is social if financial inclusion to become more developed in better country to have a better life and as our uh, colleague from uh, London explained this morning, sometimes to have only finance is uh, accrued problems for women. It means that we have to combine financial services with non-financial services. I am not speaking only on reproductive health, but also, also on information about providers for violence against women, about human rights, about the rights to go to elections, about political participation, about entrepreneurship, about business. I think that we cannot have only financial services. We have to combine services, financial services with non-financial services. And for that, I am very proud to share with my colleagues from Agfond Banks the non-financial non services that we put in place in Kauter we have uh, this uh, center of excellence in uh, non-financial education and i think that uh, to train especially civil society especially uh, ngos uh, because you know that uh, in uh, uh, ngos we have a lot of members who are uh, graduated but not employed and we have to inform them to encourage them to put them in confidence because trust is very important to let them going to these service providers because they are afraid to go there and we have to really build their trust that they can go and they can get 
not only the credit, but all the magnific services that in Bahrain and in other banks, even in Tunisia, we can give a lot. But we have to push our youth population to go there because, as uh, Mr. Norman said, yes, we have a lot of very, very good uh, uh, services and uh, NGOs and uh, uh, experiences, uh, but I think that we have really to scale up. Absolutely. I think the point that we need to and take to is that women empowerment is a cross-cutting uh, issue. Uh, from the slide that uh, we've shown to the audience, it's also linked to many of the SDGs. Uh, so uh, it's uh, at the heart of uh, each one of them, I think, that uh, uh, the women's role in society, in economy, and also financial inclusion is also one of the means to reach uh, sustainable development goals. I would like to I, turn I, I to I just, I just want to add please. some just want to, to add something. Sometimes I am invited to speak about goal five. And I propose to speak about all the other goals, not on the goal five. Because the goal five is dedicated to women, but we have to gender all the other sixteen. And only if we engender mm. the other sixteen, we will get some solution and some progress. Very good. Very good. Sabine, I believe that you have also some slides to show us. If we can get them on uh, the screens. And uh, from you, Sabine, would uh, love to hear uh, what's the role of uh, the uh, UN Capital Development Fund in this uh, uh, spectrum. Thank you very much. If the slides are there, great. If not, it's all right. Um, you know, as Sukena mentioned um, earlier, and I really can relate to it, saying the power of information. You need to have the information. An example of making sure, for instance, that all our constituencies and women have the information on financial service points is an example of what we've done in uh, Senegal and in Benin. We've had to put online uh, service point mapping on a portal where you can go by province, by city, by county, you can actually see the list of banks, microfinance, mobile money agents in the specific area. And it is a tool that we've actually used to map out our interventions because thanks to that tool, for instance, there is a city in Senegal called Medina Yorofula where we were able to see that there is a ratio of less than one financial institution for 10,000 people. Less than one financial institution for 10,000 people. I was walking yesterday. How does it compare in developing world? <laughs> I was walking yesterday on the, to come to the restaurant where we're meeting. I actually counted 10 points of services, <laughs> banks. Just, just walking. Yeah. So, I mean, small, it doesn't compare. Uh, so it shows that there are opportunity for us to really work on finding alternative solutions for our markets. Bricks and mortar is not gonna do it for us. So earlier you had mentioned branchless banking solutions. We've also implemented in um, Senegal, in Benin, in uh, also Uganda, as well as Zambia, projects where we've actually partnered with um, fintechs, startups, and also Asian network aggregators to go into these rural areas and actually leverage women to be mobile financial service agents. And if you had the slide, you would see on this slide the work that we've done in Malawi, in Benin, in Senegal, partnering with the likes of uh, Orange Money, Zona, MTN, uh, Move to actually develop um, in, uh, women agent networks. And what we find out that, interestingly enough, women agents were more successful at unrolling other women into having mobile money wallets, and they were also more successful at getting the other women to start using mobile money on their phone. So that's an example of digitances, of providing integrated solutions so that we are facilitating access but we are also helping women develop the usage to be able to leverage these digital so services for their own employment. So solution exists. 
the solutions exist, and like you said, and you said as well, we have to scale them up. And remittances actually offers a, a great opportunity for us to do so. There's an estimate of 258 million people who are working outside of the country of origin, living outside of the country of origin, including myself. The other day we had that question, where are you from? And we're all like, huh, uh, yeah, well, is it where I live, you. where I work? Where <laughs> I... <laughs> so we at UNCDF are really focused on leveraging remittances for development. And our goal is really to contribute to SDG 10C, whereas by leveraging digital channels for remittances, we are able to contribute to lowering the cost of remittance to below the 3%. But we don't think that's enough. We think even if you have the digital channel, if people are able to remit directly into a mobile wallet, you need to have the order integrated factors where you're also leveraging the information and what are the activity generating, uh, the gen activity, revenue generating activities in the areas where they are, what are the skills that they can build on entrepreneurship to be able to leverage that remittance money into productive use, and also how we link digital savings, digital credit, digital insurance, so they're able to secure their money, they're able to have access to investment, and they're able to protect themselves against shock. With that, we'd like to uh, close the session. Uh, please join me for a very warm round of applause to our esteemed speakers. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you all.